Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Live with Lawn. I am so glad that you're with us today. And um, we have one of the most famous passages in the Bible to talk about today. Uh, it's a passage, I think, if you have been reading the Bible at all or know your Bible, uh, you'll know about. Uh, but it's an amazing chapter that we're going to spend several weeks on taking it apart and really appreciating the depth of the teaching and the depth of the uh, uh, spiritual uh, challenge uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is giving us uh, here in this passage. So without any further ado, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much, Lord, for your care for us. And Lord, as we open the word of God now, we pray that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds and our spirits, that we might fully grasp the teaching of your word, the depth of your word, the impact of your beautiful and holy word. Oh God, uh, really use your word in our life today. And Lord, before we start, help us take a minute right now just to quiet our hearts confess our sins, and uh, be ready to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Oh, and by the way, uh, we still have room on our Footsteps of Paul tour uh, it's going to be an amazing tour going through Acts chapter 16 to the end of the book of Acts, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Rome, all these cities you've read about in your Bible for years. So the in information is on our website, lonsolomonministries.com, uh, and we'll be posting information about our October 22 uh, Holy Land tour there in a couple of weeks. So I hope you can join us. Now, let's move on with studying the Bible. Okay, well, uh, the chapter that I'm talking about today is in John's Gospel, uh, John chapter 4, uh, the story of the woman at the well. And if you remember, we're doing the Gospels together, and we've reached uh, the triumphal entry in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, and now we've gone back to John's Gospel, beginning at chapter 1. And we are catching up uh, to the triumphal entry as narrated in John's Gospel, chapter 12. And then we'll merge all four of the Gospels and look at the last week of Jesus's earthly life. So as we're doing that, we just finished with chapter 3, uh, the amazing story of Nicodemus and uh, his coming to talk to Christ where Jesus says to him, you must be born again. If you didn't get those messages, my friend, you have got to go back and listen to those several messages from chapter three. But now we move on to John chapter four. Uh, like I said, one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. In fact, Rembrandt uh, actually painted in the early 17th century uh, a uh, picture of what he thought this confrontation, this meeting uh, with the Lord and the woman at the well looked like. Let me put that up on the screen for you. And uh, uh, I don't know if it looked exactly like this, but I think it was close. Here we go. Let's dig in. Uh, ver uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 1. And I'm reading from, of course, uh, the New King James version of the Bible. So. Remember we, what we study here on Lon Solomon Ministries. Say it with me. We study, come on, the Bible, the whole Bible, and what? Nothing but the Bible. That's exactly right. And that's what we're going to do today, and then we're going to apply it to our lives. So here we go, John chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples stopped. 
Remember last week we talked about this, where back in chapter 3, uh, the disciples of John come to him, and uh, they complain to him uh, that Jesus is now baptizing more people than John. And remember, John uh, says uh, he must increase, uh, but I must decrease. Uh, so this is what we're talking about here in the beginning of chapter 4, verse 1. And why was Jesus concerned about this that the Pharisees heard? Well, friends, the Pharisees were not his friends. The Pharisees were his sworn enemies. And the fact that he was becoming more popular uh, and that more and more people were flocking to him uh, uh, made it uh, more dangerous for him uh, around the Pharisees. Uh, just made them angrier and more determined to get rid of him and so Jesus just decided it's time for a cooling off period uh, between him and the Pharisees. So we headed north back up to the Sea of Galilee. Now, verse three, and the Bible says he left Judea and he departed into Galilee. Of course, Galilee is the region up north around the Sea of Galilee. Judea is the region in the, uh, to the south of that around Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and in between those two geographical uh, regions is the place called Samaria in the days of Jesus. Now, look at verse 4. But he needed to go through Samaria. John 4, verse 4. Now, I love the King James, the old King James translation uh, of this passage. And here's what it says. Let's put it on the screen. It says, verse 4, but he must needs go through Samaria. I, I love that translation. How poetic is that? He must needs pass through Samaria. Uh, the Greek word here means to pass through means just what it says. It only appears two times in the New Testament here and in Luke's gospel. Uh, and it's used with a word that means uh, I, he uh, obligation or necessity. Uh, he, that's why the King James translates it, he must needs go. Uh, and here's what some of the other translations say. He needed to go through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. It was necessary for him to go through Samaria. And I loved one translation, and it behooved him to pass through Samaria. Jesus felt compelled in his spirit that the way he needed to go between Judea in the south and Galilee up north was through Samaria. Now, I'm going to show you a map, and I want you to see where the woman at the well was uh, but I also want you to notice that between uh, uh, the north and the south was this area called Samaria. And if Jesus took a, uh, a straight line, uh, like the crow flies, from Judea, Jerusalem, back to Capernaum, his headquarters around the Sea of Galilee and some, uh, uh, up the north, he would walk right through Samaria. You say, well, then I don't understand. What's the big deal? Why would the scripture even mention that he felt compelled to go through Samaria? Of course he'd go through Samaria. It's the shortest route. Yeah, but, and I've told you this before, but let's repeat it because it's critical. A pious Jew would never in the days of Jesus go from Galilee to Judea or Judea to Galilee through Samaria. Never. Let me show you the route they would take. Let's put this map up. They would go down to Jericho from Jerusalem. They would cross over the Jordan River. They would go north on the east side of the Jordan River, uh, modern day the country of Jordan. And then as they got farther north up near the Sea of Galilee, they would cross back over the Jordan River to the west and then they would proceed on up into Galilee. You say, well, why in the world would they go all the way out of their way like that? Uh, because uh, the Jewish people 
uh, hated the Samaritans at the time of Jesus. Uh, they looked on them as like half breeds. And uh, uh, because, let me give you a tiny bit of history here. If you remember, after King Solomon, uh, the nation of Israel divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom uh, only lasted about 200 years. Uh, and then they were conquered by the Assyrian Empire based in Nineveh, which is in northern modern-day Iraq. The Assyrian, not the Syrians like we think of today, but the Assyrian Empire captured the northern kingdom, and the Assyrians made it a part of their empire. Now, the Assyrians did not conquer Judea. Remember Sennacherib and the story about how God's angel destroyed 185,000 of his troops uh, it's in the book of Isaiah. It's in the book of Chronicles. Yeah, uh, well, those were the Assyrians trying to take Judea, but they never did. However, they took the northern kingdom in 721 BC. And the, uh, stick with me now, This stick with me. Uh, the Assyrians had a practice uh, in their empire uh, when they captured a country. Uh, they took most of the local population and dispersed them all over the Assyrian empire and they brought people from the other parts of the Assyrian Empire, Gentiles now, and settled them in this newly conquered kingdom, the Northern Kingdom. Why did they do that? Uh, to keep nationalism down. You know, if some country ca captured America and they left all of us as Americans in our country, we would see places like Mount Rushmore and the Washington Monument and the Alamo uh, and, and the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and we would become very patriotic, and it would stir inside of us revolt and nationalism against our conquerors. Well, the Assyrians weren't stupid. They understood that. So if they export you and me, some conqueror does, to outer Mongolia, uh, and we, we're riding on sheep. Well, I don't think you ride on sheep. We're riding on whatever they ride on out there, camels, I don't know. And we're just struggling to even live and put food on the table for our family, we're not going to be interested much in revolting. Uh, we're just interested in surviving. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so these imported Gentiles married uh, the Jews who were left behind in the northern kingdom and produced this half-breed of people called the Samaritans. Uh, they still used uh, the five books of Moses in their worship, but they did not use the prophets like Isaiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or anything else like that, just the five books of Moses. Now, the Jews despised them and uh, looked down on them with great contempt. And we're going to see that in a moment when the woman says, what are you doing talking to me? Jewish people don't talk to Samaritans. So you understand this is significant that Jesus felt compelled not to go back to Galilee the way a pious Jew should go, the way every pious Jew did go, but to go through Samaria. Now, why did he feel compelled to do that? Well, he had an appointment with a young lady at a well uh, up in the middle of Samaria. And let's look at it. Here we go. Verse 5. So he, Jesus, came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. When they split up uh, the tribes uh, at, at near Jacob's death, read about it in the book of Genesis, he gave this area to Jacob's sons. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Now we're gonna we can talk about Jesus being wearied and his humanity that it was real, uh, uh, but we're not gonna do that today. Uh, notice it was the sixth hour. Uh, the day began at the first hour, which was six a.m. So the sixth hour was noon, middle of the day, hot, very hot. Okay, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, did Jesus 
start a conversation with her uh, because uh, he was lonely? No. Did he start a conversation with her because he was thirsty? No. Uh, did he start a conversation with her uh, because he wanted companionship? Uh, no. No. The, the purpose of this conversation, uh, like every other conversation Jesus had, was evangelistic, was uh, uh, to lead this woman to salvation in Christ. Now watch. Give me a drink. Verse 8. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it? Watch. Look, that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. John adds the note, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, Jesus says, me, and he, I would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, no bucket. And the well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Uh, the woman begins to sense that something is unusual about this gentleman, uh, not just an ordinary person. And Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water, that is from the well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Now, this Quote by Jesus, whoever drinks the water I'm giving him, uh, the water will spring up in him like everlasting life. He makes a comment again like this in John chapter 7. Look at John chapter 7, uh, verse 38. Jesus said, he who believes in me, well, well, verse 37 first, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water uh, out of his innermost being. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, look back with me uh, in the book of Isaiah. Let's put it on the screen. Isaiah uh, chapter 58, verse 11. Here's where the scripture is talking about that. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and, and, and give you strength to your bones. And you will be like, here it is, a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. A spring of water coming up from inside whose waters never fail. Um, as Jesus said, you will be like uh, a spring of water out of whose heart will flow rivers of living water, John chapter 7. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Uh, he's talking about salvation. Uh, and uh, now the woman says, Lord, give me this water. Who would turn down water like this? Amazing that in our world so many people do. Uh, uh, but the woman is, is smart. Who's going to turn down this kind of water? Now. Uh, just before we stop, uh, for so what? Let me just go back to Rembrandt's painting. Let's put it back up again. Notice that the woman and Jesus are alone. Would you notice that? There's nobody else there at the well. And so this conversation that they have, they're able to have freely uh, without anyone else being around and listening in uh, with them, with Jesus not having to talk loud or take her over to the side or whatever, whatever, uh, with her not being embarrassed with whatever he's saying. Uh, why? Uh, Rembrandt was correct in painting the two of them there alone. It's not just an artistic feature. It's actually what happened. You say, why? Well, women 
in the ancient Near East at the time of Jesus were the ones who went to the well and got water, not men. Uh, the men sent their wives to go do this. Now, you, you might not like that, and you may think that's sexist, uh, but don't get mad at me. <laughs> I'm just telling you uh, the way it was. And don't get mad at the Bible. The Bible's just telling you the way it was. And uh, so the woman came to the well, but there were no other women there. Why? Because nobody draws water in the heat of the day at noon. Are you kidding? You know how hot it gets in Israel, uh, particularly in the summer at noontime? Uh, hot. Uh, they would come at 6 a.m. or at 7 a.m. when it was cool, or they would come at the very end of the day when it was cool. Nobody came at noon. So what was this woman doing here at the sixth hour? Friends, Jesus is about to say, go call your husband. She's about to say, I don't have a husband. He's about to say, no, you've had five husbands. And the guy you're shacking up with, living with, is not even your husband. This woman was an outcast. This woman uh, was a uh, considered a prostitute. This woman uh, was considered by the other people in the town a person of very low morals. And uh, she didn't want to come to the well when all the women were there early in the morning and be shamed uh, by all these women speaking down to her, looking at her, treating her uh, uh, in, a, in a terrible way. So she comes at noon when nobody's there. So she doesn't have to face the, fame, uh, the shame and the rejection of the people in the town. Do you understand? So Jesus timed his arrival uh, perfectly uh, to meet her. He knew exactly in his omniscience and his sovereignty what time this woman was going to be at the well. And he timed it perfectly so he was there when she was there. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, now we're going to come back to that right in a second. But first, we want to say our most important question. So are you ready? Come on now. Here we go. One, two, three. So what? <laughs> yeah. And how sweet it is, baby. Yes, sir. How Say with me how sweet it is to be teaching and studying the word of God. Now, Jesus must needs uh, go through Samaria. Why? We already said it. In his omniscience and in his sovereignty, he had a divine appointment. And this woman had a divine appointment that she didn't know about till she got to the well. And in order to meet this woman, who Jesus knew would believe in him, and as we're going to see, not just uh, uh, her, but as her result of her testimony, uh, the whole town was going to believe in him uh, of Samaritans. He needed to go through Samaria, even though that was not the normal route. So that he was right where he needed to be when that woman was there. And look, that woman was right where she needed to be. When he showed up, do you understand? This is no accidental meeting. No, no. This meeting had been planned in the annals of the Godhead since eternity past. And Jesus knew um, she would be there. And he went to meet her. Now, is that, that's wonderful. Is that awesome? You know what this means, of course. What this means is God is sovereign over every detail. In this woman's life, uh, she doesn't know she's going to meet him at that moment uh, uh, at the well, uh, but he knows. And she was exactly where she was supposed to be. You understand? She was exactly where she was supposed to be. Now, I don't know what else happened during the day or whatever, but God in his wonderful omnipotence and sovereignty made sure whatever else it was, she walked to that well right at the moment that she showed up. Now, friends, this has enormous uh, um, impact for our life. Jesus knows everything about our life, too. He knows exactly where we're going to be, when we're going to be there. And he makes sure he's there uh, every, all day long, every day, wherever we are, because he will never leave us nor will he ever forsake us. Uh, he's always there 
uh, even if he has to go out of his way, it, 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 logically, like he did here, I'm sure his disciples wondered, why in the world is he cutting through Samaria? Uh, this is crazy. And it wasn't crazy. Jesus is sovereign, and he knew. But let me flip it around and talk about us from the women's woman's point of view. Folks, I had a good friend. I still have her. Name is Mary Doremus. And she used to always say to Brendan and me, where you are is where you're supposed to be when you're there. May I repeat that? Let's put it on the screen. Mary Doremus, where you are is where you're supposed to be when you're there. This is how sovereign God is. And uh, why is that? Because God has a purpose for every moment of our life. And, and he makes sure uh, that we're always right where we need to be. Now, we don't believe this sometimes. The job we're in, uh, where things are going tough, or as I told you a week last week, that my boss was always picking on me. Uh, um, I was supposed to be right where I was. Uh, Brenda and I, uh, having Jill uh, and suffering, suffering through these years, particularly the early years with Jill, Mary would always say to Brenda, Brenda, where you are is where you're supposed to be when you're there. This is exactly where you're supposed to be, right here on the floor, giving Jill CPR or waiting for the rescue squad, spending the weekend in the hospital, whatever it is, this is where you're supposed to be. God is sovereign, and he makes sure of that. And friends, maybe you've got some tough situations in your life, and you're saying to God, what's the deal? Friends, where you are right now is where you're supposed to be in the sovereignty of God while you're there. And when the sovereignty of God says he's done with whatever situation it is, it's time to move on. God will see to it that you move on. Uh, that's how sovereign God is. Now, how you say, how does this work? How does he coordinate all the circumstances in life? so that I'm exactly where I want to be, I mean, where I need to be when he wants me. Friends, I don't have the slightest idea. How did he coordinate everything in the woman's life so she was exactly at the well at the sixth hour when Jesus sat down and the disciples had gone away? I don't know. He just does it. That's why he's God and I'm not, and you're not. He can do this. So I want to encourage you, my friends. You're right where you're supposed to be. And God has a purpose for where you are right now. And every place you will ever be for the rest of your life, God has a purpose for that. If you're single, you're right where God wants you to be at this moment in time. If you're pregnant or you can't get pregnant right now, you're right where God wants you to be at this moment in time. If you don't have a job right this second, you're right where God wants you to be at this very moment in time. If your children are having struggles or your grandchildren, uh, you're, they're right where God wants them to be at this very moment in time. Everything in the universe is right where God wants it to be at this moment in time. Uh, it may not make sense to you and me, but... Isaiah 58 goes on to say, my ways are above your ways and my thoughts are above your thoughts. So God, it doesn't matter what makes sense to you and me. God had a plan for that woman in John chapter 4, which meant at, she, at the well, she was right where she was supposed to be right when she was there. You know, I was um, at CVS Pharmacy picking up some prescriptions uh, several weeks ago. I was standing in line, uh, and when I got up to the cashier, the la lady was very nice, but she said, oh, no, you got to go stand over there in that other line. And I was like, oi. So I went over, got in the line. I don't like standing in lines. Uh, maybe you don't like standing in lines. Uh, so I was just kind of mm, just standing there. And all of a sudden, the, the woman, I, I got up to being the very next person after the uh, lady who was at the counter. The woman who was at the counter had a child with her. He looked to be about 16 years old, a boy, about her height. And it was clear uh, that he was um, 
struggling with a disability. He was holding her hand very tenaciously, as though he didn't feel secure uh, uh, without holding her hand. And the whole time they were standing there and she was being helped, uh, he never said a word. Uh, even though the lady at the counter tried to uh, say a couple things to him, he, he never spoke. Uh, he had some physical disabilities that I noticed. And I was assuming he had some intellectual disabilities. And I just stood there watching him. And I thought, boy, this is interesting that here I am. I was in the other line, but now they she put me over in this line. And I hadn't even noticed the boy or her up to that moment. Anyway, she finished at the counter and she started to walk off. And I said to the guy behind me, I said, you go ahead and go. Um, just you go ahead and go uh, ahead of me. And I went over and she started walking up one of the aisles and I followed her for a few feet. And I said, excuse me, ma'am. And she turned around. You could tell she was very defensive and very uncomfortable. And I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. I said, my name's Lon Solomon. And uh, I was the pastor here uh, in the Washington area for many, many years of McLean Bible Church. And I said, I, I noticed your son um, while you were standing in front of me. And I'm wondering, uh, I said, I have a daughter with multiple disabilities. And I'm just wondering if your son might be struggling with a disability. And she said, yes. And we talked about it for a couple of minutes. Uh, and found out he was 16. And I found out his name. And she said yes, and she was telling me about his rather severe disabilities, intellectual as well as physical, as I'd guessed. And then I said to her, I said, ma'am, uh, since your son is only 16, uh, or maybe he's 15, whatever, I said, we, I don't know if you've ever heard of a place called Jill's House, but we have a wonderful place called Jill's House, where your son can go and have a wonderful time and where he can have fun like at an amusement park and he's safe and where you can get a much needed rest and break. And she said to me, oh, she said, I know about Jill's house. And I said, really, you do? I said, I was very excited. I said, you do? I said, that's wonderful. I said, ma'am, uh, you, you, I want you to call them and get an appointment scheduled for an intake uh, appointment uh, so your son can start going there. And she said, well, I've already had that appointment and he was approved, uh, but it was going to cost me $75 um, per visit. And she said, just to be honest with you, she said, I can't afford $75 two, three, four times a month. I, I can't afford it. And suddenly, Mary Doremus's words rang in my head. Lon, where you are is where you're supposed to be when you're there. Being in that line behind this woman was where you were supposed to be, not another line. And this woman being in line in front of you was where she was supposed to be. And if you'd have gone directly to the first, the, the line that you should have gone to first, you would have missed this woman. Now, because you would have been five or 10 minutes early to the line and she'd have been way behind you. So you needed to stand in that other line and be bumped over to the second line. Are you with me? Everything happened exactly the way it was supposed to happen. God knew what he's doing. And I said to her, I said, ma'am, I said, I tell you what. Yeah, and I gave her my name and my phone number. I said, I want you to call Jill's house back. And I want you to tell them that you met me, use my name, give my phone number if they don't believe you're telling them the truth. And uh, and I want you to tell them that I volunteered uh, to pay uh, for your son's $75 as many times a month for as many months as he's still of age to attend Jill's house. I will pay your $75 out of my pocket, personally. I said, by the way, you know the Jill, the Jill's house is named after? It's my daughter. She got tears in her eyes. She's like, are you kidding? That's your daughter? I said, yes, ma'am. So I said, ma'am, I said, I understand. She said, no, no, I can't take that. I said, ma'am, look at me. I understand. I do. 
And the $75, it's my joy. It's my privilege, my honor to pay the $75 for your son. And I'll do it as many times per month as, as he wants to go or you want to let him go. Uh, I'll pay for it. Don't worry. It's covered. It's taken care of. You just call them and tell them. That's all you have to do. And I'll take care of the rest. And I gave her a hug and off she went and with her son. And I had tears in my eyes and I thought, dear Lord Jesus, what an amazing God you are. You knew that woman had called Jill's house. You knew she couldn't afford $75. You knew that I would pay that for her, Lord. By the grace of God, you've blessed me to the point that I can afford to do that. And you knew I would. And you put the two of us together in the most unlikely place. And we were both right where we were supposed to be. And even though I was huffing and puffing about being in line number two, I can't believe I got to stand in the second line. You know what I'm saying? You, you, I, I, <laughs> I was right where I was supposed to be, right when I was supposed to be there, my friend. So were you. You may not see it quite yet. I didn't see it standing in the line. But now I understand. Now, God makes no mistakes. He makes no miscalculations. And everywhere you are is where you're supposed to be when you're there because of the sovereignty of Almighty God. Jesus must, needs, go through Samaria. And you must, needs, go to the places where God guides you every single day, even if it looks random to you. You must, needs, go there, because God has a reason, a purpose for you to be right where you end up being. You know, knowing that makes the whole world take shape, makes the whole world uh, uh, make sense, uh, that it's not random, but it, it, it's all being run according to a perfect divine plan. I hope that'll bring encouragement to your heart today, my friends. Um, you're right where you're supposed to be. So enjoy it. As Paul said, in everything, give thanks. First Thessalonians 5. For this, where you are, is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for reminding us of your sovereignty today. Thanks for reminding us uh, that in everything, even when we mumble and grumble, we should be giving thanks because you've set everything up perfectly like you did for me and that woman in CVS. God, forgive us for our complaining. Uh, uh, and our negativity uh, when we don't like or we don't understand uh, something that's going on. Lord, help us to know that because of your sovereignty, because of your omnipotence, because of your omniscience, uh, we're right where we're supposed to be. And help us to give thanks to you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Uh, what was that today? Tell me, what was it? What was it? It was, what was it? Parichin. <laughs> you got it. And it encouraged my heart today to remind myself uh, uh, of this great truth. Where I am is where I'm supposed to be when I'm there and in everything give thanks because of that. I hope it'll encourage your heart. God bless you. We're going to pick up in John chapter four. We're not done with this. Lord willing, next week. Don't miss it. God bless you.